Well, thanks for being here again. Uh, Super excited about jumping into the last week of this series, and I want to start off by showing you uh, some pictures of just some greatness, okay? Uh, So I've got some pictures of some family right here. This first picture is of the Fike family. So uh, Fike is my wife Rachel's maiden name, and so this is all of her siblings. She's one of seven, y'all. It's a big old family. Yeah, any big family members? Anybody got big families in here? More than Anybody got more than seven siblings? Michelle, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not, <laughs> that's, that's great. I love it. That's awesome. Uh, so Rachel's, yeah, one of seven, and these are all you know, grandkids, nieces and nephews, grandparents are in there, and there's more kids now than there were at this point. It's taken like two years ago. So huge, huge family. The next picture uh, is of me and some of my siblings. There's two more that are not in the picture. Um, This is actually really cool because this was last summer, I think, right? Got to go to Arizona and visit, and this is the first time since I was like itty bitty that this many siblings of mine have been together in the same place since I was probably like six or seven years old, Um, maybe even younger. Really, really cool, but those are my brothers and sisters. And then the last one is um, of my uh, adopted family, if you will, the Johnsons. I've talked about the Johnson family a lot here on Sundays. Uh, This is a family that uh, my senior year of high school that, again, they basically adopted me. They brought me in as one of their own. They call me their fourth son. And so you see that they have just brought Rachel and I in. Those are siblings and mom and dad. It's It's all a big thing. So this is our family. And the reason I wanted to show you this is one, to brag, okay, because I love my family and they're awesome. Uh, But the other reason is I wanted to give you a little insight as to what we're going to be talking about today, because we're talking about extended family. You know, come on, easy conversation, everything's going to be fine, should be no issues at all, right? So that's what we're going to discuss today. Some of y'all, you saw the, the number of people in the family and you just went, how? You know what I mean? Like, how do you do Thanksgiving? What does Christmas look like? How do you go to all the things? Because there is all the things when you come out of a family like that. There's all the things even if your family's smaller. So we are going to wrap up this series with a discussion on extended family. If you've been with us throughout this series, it's all about relationships. We've talked all about different kinds of relationships from marriage to uh, parenting uh, to how we associate with our parents, you know, uh, just, just as adults, friendship, all kinds of relationships, um, and, and sometimes the hurt that comes with those relationships because relationships are hard. Um, people matter, but people can be difficult to deal with. We can be difficult to deal with. Amen? And so we wanted to walk out these relationships and see what the Lord has to say about them, and we're going to continue that today. And so to, to kick off this conversation on extended family, I have a verse for you. This verse comes from 1 Timothy. It's 1 Timothy 5.8. It says, Anyone, here we go, who does not provide for their relatives, and especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. figured we'd start really chill. <laughs> Just easy, you know what I mean? This is crazy, y'all. I don't know if, you've, if, you, if you know about this passage of Scripture that comes out and stuff like that, but this is the Apostle Paul, okay? And he's just coming out, and, and, and this, is just, this is just the right hook, you know, right to the face. Like, if you don't take care of your family, worse than an unbeliever. You've denied the faith. You're like, dude, calm down, right? Let me, I just want to give some context really quick, because we kind of need to know what's going on here. When you read a verse like that, I don't know about y'all, but like, I'll read a verse like that and go, oh, I got to reread everything I just read, because either I'm doing things really wrong, and, or I'm, and I'm in trouble, or I miss something, you know? So we're going to look at some things that sometimes I think we miss when we read this verse. So some context, uh, this comes out of a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote a man named Timothy. So if you don't, if you don't know about the relationship between Timothy and Paul, Paul was Timothy's mentor. So the Apostle Paul, of course, huge in the early church, wrote a ton of the New Testament, went around basically planting churches, spreading the good news of Jesus, and Timothy felt called to do this as well. So Paul brings Timothy along as, you know, his his pupil, his mentee, if you will, and he's like, hey, let me show you around. Let me show you the ropes on how we do this thing where we spread the good news and we we plant these churches and we, we bring people to Jesus. And so eventually they hit a place called Ephesus, and Paul's like, Timothy, it's your turn. You're going to lead the church here in Ephesus. You're going to take care of this town and help these people know Jesus. So if you know the verse uh, in, in 1 Timothy where it talks about, hey, don't look down on somebody because they're young, right? Don't set them aside or think that they're not able because of their age. We've been talking about that with our student ministry right now, uh, and it's a very real thing. This is, again, Paul talking to Timothy because Timothy's a very young dude. 
And for him to step into this role of leadership and go, hey, I'm going to lead this church, it's a big deal. And Paul knows that struggles will come for Timothy. Paul knows that there's some danger in the midst, and he wants to encourage Timothy. He wants to provide for him still. He wants to lead him and guide him and just give him wisdom to keep leading this church well. So he writes these two letters, which is where we get first and second Timothy. And that's where this verse comes from. First Timothy, again, is in a letter that Paul wrote. And in the specific section of this first letter, Paul is actually talking to Timothy about the support of widows, right? So what's going on right now in Ephesus is there are a bunch of uh, widows who are being kind of pushed toward the church um, for care. So they've lost their spouse and uh, the church is getting all these widows coming in and like, we need help. We need to be taken care of. Because at that point in time, there were a lot of things that left widows just kind of abandoned. If they didn't have a support system. It was like they were just kind of on their own. And so they needed help. They needed support. And the church was stepping in. And people were pushing them towards the church for that support. Well, what Paul is saying right here is these widows, most of them, a lot of them, have family members. And a lot of them have family members who could easily, who have the means to step in and take care of their family. They could come in and go, oh, you're, you, you lost your husband, Aunt Sue. You lost Uncle Bob. We should step in and take care of you. Amen? Because we're your family, and we've got the means to take care of you. We can support you. But instead, what these families are doing is they're going, hey, we have the means, Aunt Sue. But there's also the church. Maybe you should just go ask them. And it's like, hold on. For sure, the church is called to come in and support and to love and to be there. But at the same time, aren't we called as family to take care of one another? Aren't we called as family to step in and help meet the needs of the ones we love? And these groups of people, these families here in Ephesus, they're just not doing that. So you have Paul coming and he's like, hold up. If you are able to provide for your family in a healthy way to take care of these widows, you better do it or else. You know, that's when he comes out the verse, he's like, you better do or else you're worse than an unbeliever. So Paul just wants him to see the seriousness of what's going on. He wants Timothy to know you got to make sure that this thing gets figured out because these families need to be taken care of there. So all that to say, when we read a verse like that, first thing that comes to my mind is like, dude, yeah, I better take care of my family. Like my extended family, not, he says like, not just my, my immediate family, not just my wife, my kids, but like my family, you know, I got to take care of of mine. And that leads us to our phrase for today. You ever heard the phrase, blood is thicker than water? You've heard that. We've heard that before, right? And what this phrase is, it's just this utmost sense of loyalty to our family. It's like, man, it's all about family. I'm going to take care of my family, brothers, grandmas, sisters, aunts, all of them. I'm going to take care of them. Blood is thicker than water. I'm going to do all that I can, be super loyal to my family. You kind of when, when you read this, I don't know about y'all, but like your inner Dominic Toretto comes out, you know? Come on. Y'all know Vin Diesel, Fast and the Furious? Like his answer to everything is, we did it because family. It's like, what are you talking about? It's like he just drove off a cliff and his car went into a plane off a hook. And he's like, you know why? Family. You know what I mean? It's like, what are you talking about? We don't have to get in. There's like a 10th movie coming out. It's going to be great. Um, but that's, you know, that's us sometimes. We're like, dude, it's all about family. I couldn't do anything without family. Everything I got to be about is family right? Family's important. Family is key. We should be taking care of our family. Yes. But can we take a moment to be very real? Hanging out with, spending time with, dealing with, however you want to phrase it, extended family is not always easy. Come on, y'all. Family can be very, very hard. And usually we have this discussion, you get closer to the holidays, and you're thinking, like, I'm about to be in the same room for three hours <laughs> with that weird uncle. <laughs> and we're going to have to have that conversation. You know what I mean? It's like family can be tough. We disagree with family. We're not always on the same page as family. We're not going the same direction as our family all the time. Family can be very, very, very hard. And so what this is, what we're discussing today, is this issue that we have with family actually a couple issues that we have with family, to swing very far into two different spaces because family's not easy. So I'm going to show you something real quick, and this is the overdone spectrum, okay? Overdone. Y'all know what that means, right? Overdone. Just over-exaggerated to the extreme, right? That's, that's it. We don't like things overdone, okay? You're like, what do you mean? Think about it. We like a good steak, right? No steak is good overdone. Can I get an amen? 
You know what I'm saying? Some of you are like, well, it's like, no, 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 no. Absolutely not. We like a good chocolate chip cookie that's not overdone. Come on, man. Like the Bustos family, I'm actually ashamed to admit this. We take them out and they're like not even fully cool. We're like, man, this is great. It's just like, you know, it's just all ooey gooey. Like, this is fantastic. This is so good. Nobody likes Chips Ahoy. <laughs> it's disrespectful. You don't like things overdone, right? A joke, a good joke. And you're like, yeah, pastor. <laughs> Nobody likes a good joke overdone. It's like there's, there's, there's a middle ground of things. There's a right end point. There's a right place for things to be just, just perfect, you know, Goldilocks. It's just got to be just right. The same is true with family. In our lives and in our relationships with extended family, we have a tendency to overdo it. In two different ways. Here's what I mean, okay? So the first way that we overdo it, far left, okay, of the screen, is family likes to place expectations on us. It's a real thing. We as family members like to place expectations on our relatives. And we say, hey, my hope, my desire, what I want from you is to meet these expectations. If you were here last week, Pastor Josh talked about friendships and how sometimes in friendships we tend to get into a people-pleasing place. And we're, what we're really doing is we're trying to, to match and meet the expectations of our friends. The same is true with family is we want to please our family. We don't want to have issues with family. We don't want to create drama. We don't want to have division. We want to keep unity. We want to keep peace. Those are all good things. But sometimes it gets to a place where we're just trying to please our family, even if we're not fully in agreement with them, if we don't like what they're doing. It's like, I just, I'm going to try to meet these expectations, even if they're so unrealistic, right? So let, just some examples, right? Ways that we might try to meet unrealistic expectations and swing far on the spectrum is, hey, you come from a big family. You saw the pictures of mine and Rachel's family. That's a lot of birthdays, y'all. That's, that's a very full schedule. And sometimes family comes in and goes, we need you to be at every one of these things. You need, you need to be at all those ball games for all your nieces and nephews. You need, to, you need to be at every Thanksgiving dinner. There's like five of them. You better be there. It's like, how? I won't even survive. You need to do all these. You better not miss out on grandma's dinner every week at grandma's house. She will cry over the meatloaf. You can't miss it. Have you been there? It's like you better meet these expectations as family or we're just going to be so broken. You, you can kind of feel the guilt. You know what I'm saying? Let's be real. That comes with it. Meeting expectations, it comes with guilt. We want to people please because we feel guilty. Like, oh, man, she's going to be so sad if I'm not there. They're going to be so sad that I missed out on their birthday. All these things that it wasn't at their game. So sometimes it's make everything fit in your calendar for meeting these expectations. Sometimes it's, hey, just be loyal. Be super loyal to family. Even if family is wrong and you know it, family. You know what I'm saying? Like, be there for family. Even if they did the wrong thing, you're like, oh, well, st still my, you know what I'm talking Like, the way I see it is, I mentioned this first service, it's like, I like grew up with two brothers. My brothers were kind of rowdy. I love them. You know what I mean? But every now and then they'd be like, get into an argument with somebody and they could be in the absolute wrong. You know what I mean? But if somebody comes up to my brother and is like, hey, I'm like, what do you mean? Hey, you know, that's my brother. You better watch out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, like I would do anything, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but they, you know what I mean? It's like you step in, you're just trying to be loyal to family, but it pulls you into a place that do you really need to be in that place? Because let's be real, your brother might've been really wrong. Maybe he deserves a left hook, you know? It's a, it's a very real thing. But we try to meet these unrealistic expectations of family. So that's one side. The other side over here on the right is we place unreasonable boundaries. So this is the far opposite. Maybe you've been hurt by family members and you're like, oh man, they, they hurt me. I didn't like how this thing turned out. So you know what I did? I just shut the door, man. I completely push them away and reject them as family. Hear me on this. There are some times when extremely high walls and boundaries are necessary, Right? With, with different relationships and family members, there's times when we got to come in and go, this just can't be this way anymore. For the safety of, of myself, of my immediate family, for our health, I've got to set strict boundaries. Amen? Very good thing. Very important thing to not let go of. However, sometimes we use the excuse, that excuse and that idea and we place it over family members who don't really deserve it. We go, oh, honestly, I just don't really want to deal with it, so I'm going to put up really high boundaries. And I'm going to just reject them and kind of end the relationship. You ever been in that before? You ever done that before? I have. We place these crazy, unreasonable boundaries because we're like, oh, it's just so much easier just to be done with it. Here's the really hard part of the conversation. 
Jesus calls us to neither one of those. He doesn't call us to meet unrealistic expectations. He doesn't call us to just people please our family. But he also doesn't call us to just go, hey, we're done. I've got to be done with you. I've got to push you away. So then where does he call us? Because he does call us, right? And when it comes to extended family, he's got some things that he wants us to know. So that's what we're going to take a look at today uh, is some moments with Jesus where he shows us otherwise with family. He shows us where we need to land so that we can be healthy, so we can have healthy relationships with our extended family members and stay out of these two far sides of our overdone spectrum. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump into God's word, okay? Uh, The truth, um, and I'm not talking about Paul Pierce, you know what I'm saying? The truth, no, basketball fans, nobody in here. I said, come on, let's go. I said that to our students and they were like, they're like the apostle? I'm like, no, dude, get out of here. So background on some Mark 3, because that's where we're jumping. If you have your Bibles, take them out. We're going to jump into the book of Mark 3. Uh, If you don't, you can uh, look at the screens and follow along here. Um, But what's going on here is we've got Jesus and the disciples, and they're traveling in Galilee, and they come to this house. And they come to the house to stay at the house for a little bit, and they come to eat, okay? Because, you know, walking around everywhere, it's like, I need to to get off my feet for a little bit. We need to eat some food. It needs to happen. Well, again, being in Galilee, where Jesus is from, so many people want to see Jesus, like, so many people have heard of Jesus. Some people, because they're in Galilee, know Jesus because that's where he's from. Like, we knew you when you were a little kid. Like, we're going to go see Jesus because Jesus is in his ministry now doing all these really crazy things, these miracles, and he's teaching all these different radical truths. And he's like, they're like, whoa, this guy's insane. We got to go see Jesus. So immediately when the, him and the disciples hit this house, all these people flood in. They show up and they're like, Jesus, what do you got? You know, and what are you going to do today? And the, the scripture says that like there were so many people around them in this house and outside of the house that it was like hard for them to even eat. Like it was, you know, that feeling like maybe you get home after a long day and you're like, I just want to chill, man. And then your spouse is like, hey, I invited 75 people over. And you're like, ah, oh, what are you talking about? You know what I mean? It's like, this is the worst thing ever. And Rachel's shaking and she's like, it's me. I do that. She doesn't do that at all. I'm like, hey. <laughs> but this is what's going on. All these people are there, right? And so they're chilling, trying to eat, talking to people, figuring it out, huge crowd. And then, of course, the Pharisees show up, just like every other moment in Jesus' life. You know, they're like the hyenas from Lion King, dude. They're just everywhere. You're like, what are you doing here? How'd you even get here, man? It's got something to say. And they're just like, oh. And so this time, it's it's crazy. They go to the furthest furthest extent possible, and they start to say, they're like, hey, we're going to make this claim. Jesus is actually possessed by Satan. He's possessed by the prince of demons, y'all. And it's like, what? And so they, they make these claims. They keep saying this. Like the only way he's driving demons out of people and performing these miracles is because he's using demonic powers himself. So, you, I mean, I just picture Jesus like at this table, the disciples eating, and he's like, okay. And, you know, he just kind of stands up. and He's like, let me say something. And so he does. Uh, and this is actually where we get the, the phrase, a house divided cannot stand, right? We've heard that before. It's Mark 3, 24 through 25. It says, if a kingdom is divided against itself, and I don't think we have a slide. Uh, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a, if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And so what he's digging into and what he also says is like, hey, man, this doesn't work. You understand that, right? Like division makes things fall apart and not work. And so he's like, so tell me, how does Satan drive out himself? He can't. It wouldn't work. It doesn't work. And so he just kind of shuts the Pharisees down. He's like, please let me eat. You know what I mean? Like, just get out of here. Go take a nap. And so they leave him alone for a second. But this is where it gets interesting. And this is where it really matters for us in our conversation of family today. Um, after this happens, Jesus' family shows up. And that's what we're going to pick up in Scripture. So Mark, 31 through, Mark 3, 31 through 34 it says, then Jesus' mother, okay, mama's here, and brothers came to see him. They stood outside and sent word for him to come out and talk with them. There was a crowd sitting around Jesus, and someone said, your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. Jesus replied, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he looked at those around him and said, look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. It's a lot of mother, brother, sisters, okay? No, kind of hard to follow and keep track with, but... Let's break down what's happening here. So you've got all these people around Jesus, right? And they've come to hear what he's got to say. They've come to see him do the things that only he can do. They're like, what's going on? And then Jesus' family shows up. So there's not a 100% answer as to why his family shows up, okay? There's a lot of that in this situation. You're like, I don't really know why that happened or why it happened this way. But his family, mom and brothers show up, right? And the first thing they do is go, hey, bring Jesus out. 
We don't know why. Like, why? why they, they know Jesus is on ministry. He's doing these crazy things, but like, Jesus needs to come out. What we do know is back in verse 21, it also says, when his family heard what was happening, they tried to take him away. He's out of his mind, they said. So it's kind of weird because in verse 21, verse, th- verse 31, it says like his mother and brother show up. So his family shows up. But earlier, 10 verses earlier, it's like, oh, his family shows up. So we don't know exactly what part of the family probably some extended family, right? Who knows Jesus again in Galilee are like, oh, we're related to that guy. He's being weird. You know what I'm saying? They come in and they're like, hey, maybe some weird uncles and aunts. I don't know. You know, I'm hating on uncles today. You guys are great. But it's like, they're like, hey, bring him out here. He's being, yeah, he's being weird. It's like, why? You know what I'm saying? Like, why, why is family choosing to do that? Isn't family supposed to have each other's back? All these other people, the Pharisees are like, oh, he's, he's possessed by Satan. Again, back to like the brother, like, what are you talking about, Jesus? But they're like, no, nah, yeah, he's weird. Get rid of him. And it's like, that's family. Why would family treat family that way? Again, no exact 100% answer. But what a lot of theologians think is there's, there might be a few reasons, okay? So one reason that they might feel this way, the family might be responding this way, is they just disagree with Jesus. They're like, dude, you left a secure home with good income as a carpenter, as a, like you, as a part of the family business, and decided, you know what? I'm going to travel and preach. You know what I mean? Like, are you kidding me? You know what I mean? You're just going to leave this safe place and go do all, just wander around and rely on other people. And get, it's like, what? So the family's like, you know, maybe they think Jesus is not wise. Like, yeah, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's just, just giving up. or Whatever they may have come up with, right? Left the security of home. Some people think maybe that they're doing this for Jesus' safety. So this is the far other end. Like, maybe they're just trying to protect Jesus. Like, that's a, a reach. But they're like, maybe they're like, they know the Pharisees are here. And the Pharisees hate Jesus. And maybe they want to hurt Jesus. And so as his family, we have to do whatever it takes to convince Jesus to get out of this house so he doesn't get hurt. Could be a real thing. I know it. Cute baby. But they're like, we got to take care of him. We got to get him out of there. And so they... They're like, for some reason, use hate <laughs> to be like, we're helping you. <laughs> Get out of the house, weirdo. And then the last potential reason, or one of, there's probably a lot more, is they see who Jesus is around. So for, for parents in the room, I know, I mean, I have these conversations a lot with parents and, and their kids. Maybe they're like, hey, we don't like the crowd he's with. Because you got to remember who Jesus is with. The 12 disciples were not the loveliest bunch they were people that were tax collectors and fishermen and the lowest of the low and were seen as cheaters and all these bad people. And so when they see Jesus with them, they're like, oh, Jesus is hanging out with the wrong crowd. He's being, he's being weird. He's doing the wrong thing. So yeah, get him out of here because he's just like the rest of them. And they start to hate. Again, we don't know for sure, but it could be any of these reasons. How many reasons do we as family members come up and think of as to why our family members are doing what they're doing? How many excuses do we come up with in how we treat our family and say, well, it's because of this, X, Y, and Z. That gave me the right to respond the way that I did. Could be what's going on here. But what we do know, okay, is that Jesus' response, his, he responds in a way that's going to impact and change so much for us when it comes to uh, this extended family. So let's look back at Mark 3, 33 through 35, the ending of what Jesus says when his mom, when Mary and his brothers show up. So Jesus replied, who is my mother? Who are my brothers, right? They show up like, bring Jesus out. Who are they, he says. Then he looked at those around him and said, look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. So when it comes to extended family, I think Jesus is revealing very, two very important things for us, two things that are gonna help us to see what his heart is when it comes to extended family and what that relationship is to look like. The first thing that I think Jesus reveals is freedom from expectations, okay? Jesus comes in, and you have to understand, when he's in this place, in this time, in this world, in Jewish culture, family was huge, okay? Like the way that Vin Diesel lives in Fast and the Furious, that was real then, y'all. Like it was like, it was family, okay? It was your job, your responsibility to be honoring to family, to be obedient to family, to set a good example of, of your family. You didn't want people walking around like, that's that family that's got those issues. You know what I mean? It's like, no, 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 you better bring some, some pride to your family. You better bring some good stuff. People better talk about us in a great way. Huge, huge in Jewish culture and tradition. What Jesus does right here is he slices right through that. Because you've got mom, you've got other family members who are like, come do this. Come to us. Get out of here. Stop doing that. And Jesus goes, no. <laughs> And I don't, think his, I don't think it was like a hateful, like, of course it's not disobedience. It's talking about Jesus, but it's like he comes in and he goes, I'm actually going to redirect this conversation. I'm going to redirect this. And I want you to know 
who my brothers and my mother and my sisters are because they're right here, right? So he cuts through this tradition and he's like, no, 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 no. No expectations. We can't cling to the tradition and expectations anymore because they bring brokenness. They get us to that far left side. We're striving to meet unrealistic expectations that we were never created to meet that actually bring so much more brokenness to us if we strive to meet them. They bring brokenness to our immediate family. They bring brokenness to our marriage, to our relationship with our kids because we're trying to prioritize these other things when God hasn't called us to that. He's called us to this, to him. So he frees us from expectations. This is what Titus 3, 4 through 6 says. But when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed, our, he washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. This is the perfect example of no expectation. It's the love that Jesus has for us. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't do it because he was like, ah, you guys are never, like, you have to meet these expectations. Like, I'm gonna die on the cross for you, but you still have to do all things right. You still have to be, like, to live in perfect righteousness. Like, you've, you've got to check all the boxes, all these things, meet my expectations. No, 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 no. There was no level. There was no standard. He said, you have to be at this before you can be in a relationship with me. He did it out of his generosity. He did it out of kindness and said, I love you. I care about you. I want to spend eternity with you. And you don't have to have, there's no condition. You don't have to meet these expectations. Just say yes. That's how it should look in our families. We should, we should model the love that Jesus has for us, <clears throat> excuse me, in our families, immediate and extended, and go, hey, and th- this is more for us, because the, 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 the flip side of this conversation, y'all, is we're trying to set up boundaries for our families to respect. Some of us have to respect those boundaries from our family members. Does that make sense? Some of us are, are hurting right now because we have, kiddos or other family members who have set up boundaries against us and we disagree with those boundaries right and we're upset about them but we're still called to love them we may not agree but we're still called to love them and so jesus comes in and goes you have to understand it's not about expectation it's not about it's not about meeting this thing you just got to love them no matter what you don't always have to agree but you have to love each other the same way God loves us. So freedom from expectations. We're not called to meet them. And when we strive, it brings more damage than good. It brings more hurt than it does help. So we've got to stop trying to strive for those expectations and live in the freedom that Jesus brings and shows us in how he loves us. So the second one is freedom to our calling. And this is the real stuff, okay? This is real good. Um, when Jesus does this, and this is that moment at the end, okay? Back, back to this verse real quick. So verse 35, at the end of what he's saying in Mark 3, Jesus says, anyone who does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. So you read the whole thing, you're like, what are you talking about? You're like, your mom's outside. We're saying this lady in front of you is your mother. Like, Anyone who does God's will, that's my family. So what Jesus is reminding us is that we are not called, again, to people please, to meet the expectations of family. We're not called to do what they think we should do. We are called to do what he says. We are called to go the way that he says. We are called by Jesus, and that calling from Jesus should be our priority. You see, really what he's doing is he's he's giving us a little loyalty check. He's saying, you need to be reminded of where your loyalty should lie because they should lie with me. And the cool, the even better thing about this, okay, is yes, he's deserving and he just has the right as our creator and our heavenly father, our savior, to go, yeah, your loyalty loyalty should lie with me and that's it. And we should go, okay. (laughs) But the really cool news is in every aspect of who I am, the best version of myself only comes when I give it to Jesus. Does that make sense? If I want to be a good son, if I want to be a good father, if I want to be a good husband. The way that I do that best is by becoming the person that Jesus has called me to be. It's by following the direction that he has called me to go as a son, as a father, as a husband, as a friend in every relationship, right? Because I can try to do it my way or the way that other people say, you should be this way. You should parent this way. You should look this way. All those other voices from family members that come in and say, this is what it should look like. This is what I want from you. Your schedule should look like this. I have to know that's not what God called me to. And if it's not what God called me to, I've got to say no. 
Like church, we have to get more comfortable with saying yes to no. We got to desire it so much more and going, no, 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 no. This is something that I'm working through right now. I have been working through for a long time. I love to, uh, not I love, I struggle to people please. I love to make people happy. I want people to feel good. I want, I want, I want your needs to be met. But the truth is, is I, wasn't crea- I wasn't created or called to do that. I was called to love you, but I have a wife who needs to be taken on date nights, who I need to spend time with, and whose relationship needs to be invested in. It needs to be priority. And so when the rest of the family is like, well, we want you to do this, this, X, Y, and Z, if it gets on date night, I've got to go, can't. That's, pri- that's what God has called me to. And Jesus comes in again. He says, you've got freedom to do that, right? Or my kids as a, as a, as a father. It's like, oh, like the church, man. I work at the church. The church is great. I feel called to this. This is great. But sometimes work becomes work and it becomes too much work or I get consumed with the work and I work too much. And I've got to go, hold on, I can't miss out on that game. I can't miss out on that time at home with them in the evening. There's too many nights. And God's saying, that's what I've called you to. Jesus brings freedom to what he has called us to, and that's in our relationship with our extended family. This is Matthew 10, verses 35 through 39. I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Your enemies will be right in your own household. If you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. Sheesh. Or if you love your son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, then you'll find it. Jesus isn't coming in and going, dude, you better get rid of all your family members. They're crazy. You know what I mean? Like, they're just too much. Cut them out. Again, he's not saying swing far on the other side of, the, of the, the overdone spectrum and just completely reject them. No, no, no. The goal that he's saying is don't lose sight of where your loyalty should lie. Don't lose sight of what I have called you to because that's the most important thing. And that will make the difference in every other aspect, your relationship with me and where I'm calling you to go, who I'm calling you to be. That should always be the priority. Here's a simple way to think about it, okay? And then we're gonna wrap, a few, we're gonna wrap it up. So Rachel and I have two kids, Liam and Ellie, right? Liam and Ellie love soda, okay? They love soda. They got babysat the other night. Ellie drank like four sodas, okay? It's not y'all's fault. (laughs) Dude, they'll, like, if they had the choice, they would rinse toothbrush with soda, you know what I mean? Like, they like it that much. And they're smart too now. You know what I mean? Like they, they love soda so much. And probably, this is I'm just bad parenting. They're like, they know. Like, look, Dad, this is caffeine free. We'll still go to bed on time. You know? <laughs> it's like they're, trying, trying to, they're figuring it out. They love soda so much. As their parent, should I just go, oh, well, you love it so much. Have it whenever you want. No. Right? Because then I'm going to have a huge dental bill. <laughs> it's like, no. What I am called to as their parent is to do whatever is best for them. Some water. That's what I'm called to, is to take care of them and do whatever is best for them. The same is true with our families. Your families will come in, our families, extended family will come in and go, this is what this should look like in your life. This is what I want your life to look like. I want you to be at the weekly dinner. I want you to be at this event. I want you to be here. But my responsibility is not to do what they want. My responsibility is to do what God has called me to. So if it means that I need to protect time with my wife, with my kids, if I, if, if, if I have a ministry thing that I feel more called to and say, like, like I've, I, I need any priority, that's just what it is because God has called me to that. And they may not like it at all, ever, or just at first, but I have to hold on to it. I have to protect it because it's absolutely what God has called me to, and that's where we need to be. Okay, let's, let's take all this. Let's wrap it up, put a bow on it, okay? Let's close this out. So I want to bring up our uh, spectrum one more time, okay? Our overdone spectrum. Meet unrealistic expectations, place unreasonable boundaries. We swing two different sides. What I need us to see today, what I believe, is that Jesus has called us, of course, to neither one of those, but to be in the middle. I believe Jesus has called us to live in the tension between the two. And you know what tension means? It means it's not going to be easy. It means there's a stretching and a pulling 
and some struggle. But it's where he's called us to be, and he's with, there. he's with us right there in the midst. So when it comes to our family, what he's actually calling us to when he calls us to that middle ground, to that space of tension, is two things. He's calling us to protect the calling he has placed on our lives. That's the first thing. Protect the calling that he has given us for us individually, for our immediate families, for our futures, for the ministries he's called us to do, we have to protect that. Because family, even though they love us, and again, their, their goal might not to be hateful or just to not care, they're going to try to pull us in different directions, right? Because they love us. They want to be around us. But we have to protect it. We have to learn to say yes to no. It's so important. And the second thing I believe he's calling us to is to love and honor our family at the exact same time. Do you see that? We can have boundaries. We need them. It's a fact. We need boundaries. We need to say no to certain things. We need to say this isn't it. This is not the right thing. But at the same time, we still need to love our family. And family, credit to, credit to Vin Diesel, should always matter. Right? We should always love them. So last thing, Jesus shows us this, how to love and honor family with his brother James. So you don't know a lot about James. Um, James and Jesus' brothers obviously grew up with Jesus. They saw Jesus grow. They ran around in diapers together probably, okay? If you know somebody so well, sometimes it's hard to believe that they are becoming or doing things that they make big claims that they're doing. So like when you think of Jesus' brothers, Jesus comes to them and he's like, oh, we grew, we, we grew up with you, Jesus. And he's like, yeah, guess what? I'm going to save the world. I'm going to change like everything. I've, I've come to bring radical, <clears throat> radical change to the world. It's like, you? You've come to do all that? It's like, no way. There's no way, dude. Jesus is like, yeah. So they really didn't believe him. James did not believe in Jesus' claim to be Messiah for quite some time. He's like, mm, I don't know about this. So if you're Jesus, put yourself in his shoes and you could say, like I think something we have a tendency to do is to kind of go, okay, well this person, they kind of hurt my feelings because they didn't believe in me. They didn't care about what I was going to do. They didn't think it was right. So far left, place some boundaries. Nope, I'm done with that person. Cut them off. Completely gone. Right? Could have done that. Like James isn't, he's just, he's just negative Nancy. You know what I mean? Jealous James. They cut him off. After the resurrection, after Jesus defeats sin and the grave, hallelujah. One of the things that he decides to do, so he starts going out, he starts seeing all these people to show them, hey, like I said, I came here to save the world came here to change everything. And in scripture, it says that one person he went directly to see was who? James. He went to his brother, James. Check out my hands, man. I'm here. I was, I was being honest. I know it's hard to believe, but I was being serious. I came to save the world. I came to change everything. You see, what Jesus did there is he showed his brother grace. And he, he chose to prioritize love for his family. You, know, you see what I'm saying, church? He, 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 he could have gone far to boundaries and said, I'm done. He didn't care about me. He didn't believe in me. So that's on James. Could have swung the other way and said, you know what? Like I, I, the whole time I should have just been trying so hard to convince James that I was who I said I was. And it should have upset me. And I should have just tried to be like, okay, maybe I'm not. You know, people please, no. Jesus is like, no, one day. I'm going to show James. And he did exactly that. And by showing James that, by going to James, he showed him, hey, I love you. I'm going to honor my family. We may not be on the same page all the time. You may think differently. But I love you no matter what. And that will never change. And in whatever way I can, as long as I'm protecting what God has called me to and prioritizing it the way I'm called to, I'll be there for you. I'll be there for you. Because you're family. And I love you so much. Can we pray, church? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today. God, we thank you that we get to be here in your house. We get to worship your perfect name, Lord. God, I pray that you just help us with family. Family is not easy all the time, God. Family can be very, very hard. But we're thankful for our family, God. We're thankful for the people you've placed in our lives, Lord. People we're called to do life with, God. And that may look different, Lord, in a lot of different ways. But we're thankful for them. God, give us the strength to remain in the tension between the two extremes, Lord. Give us the ability, the wisdom to do so, God. 
to prioritize family, to love on them, Lord, but in the way you've called us to, Lord, without swinging too far, without striving to people please and meet expectations that we were never called to, Lord, and without rejecting family and losing sight of the importance of relationship, Jesus. Your word says that whoever cannot love their brother or sister is a liar and does not actually love the Lord, Lord. And you're not trying to be harsh in that place. You're just trying to get us to see the value of relationship. Help us to do exactly that, Lord, to not lose sight of it, to honor our family in all the ways that we can while still going the way you've called us to, by becoming who you've called us to. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. It's in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said, amen.